Uh, for the first time, we have a, an American country and Western gospel singer, a man who's had 16 number one hits all over the world. Great guy, great character. He became a Catholic at 23 years of age. So please put your hands together for Mr. Colin Ray. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. And welcome to the conference. It is such an honor for me uh, to, to be here today, and, and especially, especially in Ireland. I, I've, I've spoken at a number of events, uh, church events back in the States, but to be asked to be here uh, for the Divine Mercy Conference is a huge honor, huge honor for me. We, we were actually in this building, the same exact building, last night, but it wasn't a, there was no altar here last night. We did a show and uh, it was so much fun, and, and uh, this is my fourth trip to, to Ireland, and I love it so much, and, and uh, for many, many reasons, but uh, without a doubt, uh, reason number one is the people, such wonderful people, and so many faith-filled people here, and so thank you for including me and allowing me to say a few words to you today. Um, I, for the, many of you, I'm sure don't know anything about me, I'll give you a real, I don't have a lot of time, so I'll try to give you a quick uh, cleft note version of of, of my story, but um, I actually was, am a convert uh, to our church. I grew up in uh, the South, in the American South, and, and there it's affect, that area is affectionately known as the Bible Belt, you know, and there's a lot of, an awful lot of different kind of Protestant churches and whatnot, and in the town, um, the town that I lived in, Texarkana is the name of it, and where I grew up, there was, there was one Catholic church that served a pretty huge area. And uh, when we were kids, everybody would drive past that Catholic church kind of really fast, you know, like, and, uh, and, then, and then there was like, there was like one Mormon church that they, they dro drove by even faster. Um, and then you know, maybe three Presbyterian, four Methodist, and like 187 Baptist churches. So that, I was a Baptist, and I grew up that way, and uh, which was, was, was great, it gave me a great... Um, uh, faith and my mom taught me how to pray at a very early age and I, I don't ever remember a time a moment in my life where I questioned uh, the existence of God I always knew him I always felt this strong hand on the back of my neck and and I knew it was God and but I did when I, as I got older and grew up I the um, the style of uh, worship and the style of faith that I had been taught just seemed like it was missing something it seemed kind of uh, I don't know maybe a little too easy and uh, in other words, the, 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 the uh, belief was that you, you accept the Lord as your Savior at some point in your life, and then you're pretty much good to go from then on. And no matter what else you do the rest of your life, no, even if you don't even try uh, to live a good life, you're going straight to heaven anyway and all that. And I thought, well, there's got to be more to it than that, you know. And so as I got older, I um, met some friends who actually uh, was drawn to and uh, led me to, and I asked him if I could, I just liked them a lot, and I, could, I knew they were Catholic, and I asked them if I could uh, join them in a mass one weekend, and they were su pleasantly surprised that I asked that, and said, of course I could, and, and I went with them the next week, and it changed my life, because there's one thing about being, a, I don't know how many converts are here with us t today, but um, there's something about being a convert, if you, as opposed to the way I raised my kids in the church, if you've never been in front of um, the tabernacle, and are never been in the, the the physical presence of Christ in the church like that. You feel it very. I did anyway. I felt it very, very um, intently and intangibly the very first time I walked in there. It was the first time I'd ever been in a church that was reverent, because our churches had always been very, very felt a lot of fellowship, very fellowship oriented and talking and joyful, and that was great. But I'd never. I was not used to coming into a place that was so reverent. And, qu and quiet, and I wasn't sure why it was, and then, of course, later I would find out why, but I loved the fact that everyone was on their knees, and I thought that was such a, you know, for the prayer of a, the pre-mass uh, prayer, and I thought, what a, that's the way we should approach God, either physically on our knees or even just uh, symbolically, you know, as we walk, as we go through life on our knees. That's the way we should approach Almighty God, and so, to, to make a long story short, I, it, I uh, knew I had found the right place, and I uh, began uh, the, my initiation, of adult initiation, and within a few months, I was a Roman Catholic, and I've, I've never regretted that decision for a second. Um, I think the reason that uh, that story was the, the, the way I entered the church and what I saw there is so fitting for, for what we are talking about and celebrating here now, divine mercy, is, is the whole part about being on our knees. 
Um, there's two sides to that. One is that all human beings should approach Almighty God in that way, kneeling in front of Him because He's everything. We, 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 we don't get another breath of life without His permission, and we certainly have no chance in eternity without His permission, without His blessing, without His grace. But the, the, the one side of that that I think uh, sometimes gets lost on a lot of folks, a lot of people is, is they start to feel so unworthy because when you do realize you do have a responsibility to try to live your faith and live as close to um, the, the way he wants you to live, now we're obviously we're, most of us are going to fail pretty miserably at that on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it's just the mindset. You start thinking, oh, I'm just not good enough. I just cannot do this. And um, when we do that, we are sort of blocking out his, blocking him from doing what he craves to do. And that is for forgiving us. And I think the, when the Lord came to Sister Faustina back, that, to, to do that is a pretty amazing thing. He doesn't, in, in history, there's not that many uh, times where he has appeared that way and was such a strong message. And I think the, the reason he did it was because he felt it was the, obviously to him, it was the message that the world of today needed more than anything else. And that is, there's nothing you can possibly do that is too big for me to forgive. That's what he was, 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 was uh, that was the message. That's the whole point of, of Divine Mercy, Divine Mercy Sunday. It's like, it, it's endless. It's an ocean. It's not just a, it's not selective. It's not relative. He'll forgive anything if you just ask him to. And you mean, and you truly are sorry. That, that's all he, he doesn't expect us. There are those certain souls in life, the saints who, who, who have been anointed and blessed in a way that they are to, to her, an heroic level you know, where, where they, they just seem to, or at least to us, it appears that it's easier for them. It's probably not easier for them. It may even be harder. But that those, those special people have been able to, to live a life so, so, so uh, of such blessing and so, such goodness that it, it, makes it, it makes us sometimes feel like we're, we're no good or we're not good enough because we can't be like them. Well, the, he, the thing about our Lord is he wants everybody he wants everybody to go to heaven. That's why he came and, and said what he did. And, and I'm so thankful that I lived in a time where I could be on earth when John Paul II was pope because when you think about the incredible uh, contributions he made to our faith and to the world as we know it during his pontificate, I mean, just, just one off the top of my head, the, 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 the Soviet Union falling, the, the, the Soviet bloc coming apart, which was a lot to do with him and, the, and uh, the decisions he made and the boldness he had in showing uh, the world and the governments of those countries that they were Christian countries, whether, any, whether the leaders wanted to admit that or not. Had a lot to do with that. All the amazing things he accomplished, but in his words... The greatest, th the greatest moment of his entire pontificate was the institution of Divine Mercy Sunday. That's, that's not a small thing. I think it, you know, he was obviously very, very moved by uh, Sister Faustina's story when he was a young priest in Poland and, and uh, maybe had it in the back of his mind that if, if I ever am elevated to some point of authority, let alone being Pope, I'm going to make sure everybody knows that story. And that's he didn't waste any time when he became Pope talking about that and he and if it, for him someone like him who is soon to be a saint uh this year right i think in april he'll be canonized now on divine mercy sunday for, for someone of that level a christian of that level to have put that much importance on the message of 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 saint faustina and and, and the divine mercy that says speaks, speaks volumes to us and i guess the as catholics sometimes we we are sort of just trained in our own minds maybe to be hard on ourselves, to be very accountable. And that's something that attracted me to the church because, again, I was from a, a style of faith that really wasn't teaching accountability per se that much. It was kind of like, well, if you want to live a good life, hey, that's great. You'll make God happy, but it's not necessary. You don't have to. <laughs> and so it, it, for us, you know, it was, it was very attractive to me that we are so accountable, that, that we do have the sacrament of reconciliation. We can go, we, we must go to confession. We must be accountable. That doesn't mean he expects us to be perfect. He expects us to be accountable. And even, in, even, the time, even during the times of life where uh, maybe it's harder to trust in that, you know, 
it, it, it's, I think especially in those times, actually. For me, I've had, a, 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 in my career, I've been uh, in the public eye now for 23 years in the United States since my first record went number one, and, and I've had a, a, a big, long career and, and a lot of ups and, and happiness and joys in my life, but, but also a lot of tragedy and, and loss. Um, I don't have time to tell you all about it today, though, everything, but one of the most significant, the most significant uh, thing that happened to my family in years past is I uh, am blessed with two precious, wonderful granddaughters. And um, one, of us, one of them, Maddie, is still with us today. She's just turned 10 years old. And her older sister, Haley, has is, 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 is moved on. We lost her in 2010. She had a uh, neurological dis disorder that we were never able to get diagnosed. I, we took her to every hospital in the America we could that thought they could do something, and no one could ever even figure out what it was. And uh, as fate, you know, God wanted it that way, and he, and he took her. He took her back in 2010, and she, would, she was almost 10 years old when that happened. Now, obviously, that's the, you know, I had, and my, that's my daughter's daughter, my baby's firstborn baby, and I'm sure I'm not the only one here today who's, who's had to, uh, to be, bury one of their own children. Nothing, I don't think anything comes any harder than that. It's, that's not natural. We're supposed to bury our parents, then our kids are supposed to bury us. We're not supposed to bury our own kids. So when that happens, it's, it's, it can be very devastating. And, uh, and people say, well, how do you get over that? Well, you never really get over it. You just learn to live with it. But I tell you what, the, when people see us the way we are today and that we are still happy and we're still full of faith and, and always smiling and always positive, well, there's only one way that happens, and that's by God's grace. That's the only way you survive those things. Amen. And so, I, uh, amen. And often, and, and often because of that, and this is something I would have never anticipated, but because of that story, especially when it was made public, um, a lot of people now come to me at the, at the concerts we do, at different events, and they, they'll have sick children with them. And uh, oftentimes it's some, something that's very similar to what Haley had, and you just know what you know what's coming, you know what what they're probably expecting is coming their way, and I think they find I don't know they find peace and comfort in talking to me because I am still happy and I'm and I'm still living and, and trying to be as fruitful as I can in the midst of that, and it maybe inspires them. And again, that's not me. It's the Holy Spirit using me. So, so I guess the, in the midst of all uh, the sadness that went along with Haley's loss and the suffering that led up to it, which was years of it, he found something beautiful out of that because she's fine. We know where she's at. We know, we, we know we're quite conf confident in where she's at. So it's the, the pity you feel, the self-pity in a way. You start to feel, you know, like, oh, my, how do we live without her? How do we live without that baby? And... Uh, but he has found something, a way to turn that into something beautiful where it affects other people. So I guess my point of that is, my mantra has always been, you praise him. When things go your way, praise him hard. When things don't go your way, praise him harder. <laughs> Amen. And, and you know why? You know why he wants that so much? Because he is a jealous God. He said in the Bible, he says, I'm a jealous God. He wants you to love him the most. That's all he wants. I mean, he, really, when you, when you look at what all God gives us, and we sometimes get so bogged down in this earthly life because it's all we know. All we know is this, you know. We don't, what's around us. We believe and we, we hope and we, we, we think we know what's coming next and everything, but at the end of the day, when it gets right down to that last minute, even possibly in life, you, 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 all, you think, well, I'm leaving all that I know. This is all that I know. So we get bogged down in that, and we forget sometimes how much he loves us every second of every moment. You know? I mean, he's never, you're never without him. He's always with you. And then you go, well, you know, so how many times have we all said at different times when it was financial struggles or, or illnesses, either to ourselves or our family or members of our family or or whatever, sometimes maybe just injustice that was being done to you. Maybe just some person at, at work or elsewhere that's just treating you bad. And you go, why is, why is this happening? There's nothing I can do about this, Lord. Why? And what do we say? Almost um, imitating what he said on the cross. You know, Lord, why have you forsaken me? He never does. He never does. He wants you to go through that for whatever reason. And maybe it's not something he caused, but he's allowing that suffering. He's allowing you to go through that. 
because he knows how much more you're going to need him. He wants you to need him. He doesn't, and this is something I learned during the course of, uh, of Haley's illness, my granddaughter's illness, is throughout the time she was sick, being the patriarch of the family, I, of course, you know, it's, 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 men, it's just in our innate nature to feel like we, we're fixers. We're going to fix everything. In other words, this isn't going to happen on my watch, you know. And I, would, I remember saying things like that to, to my daughter and family. Don't worry, Haley's going to be all right. We're going to find out what's wrong with her. Like I, could do something, like I could do something about it. But I really thought that we could if we just, or even worse yet, you say, no, God's going to do something about this. Why? Because I said so. How silly is that? And he just sits back and goes, bud, you, you have no control over anything. And eventually it breaks that. Sometimes that kind of um, strength is a virtue, no doubt. In life as men, especially we, all of us, men and women, you have, to have that, you have to have strength. But at the same time, it can become a stumbling block because it is keeping you from hitting your knees. It does stop you from, you know, symbolically and internally and emotionally and spiritually hitting your knees and realizing, I got, no Lord, I got nothing. I got nothing here. Reduce That's what he wants. And I think those, those, those trials that we deal with in life are come our way because he's going to break you down. I have one standing uh, motto that, I, that I've, I, I say all the time to people. Whenever you meet someone who's just so, maybe so full of themselves or, so, or thinks they're almost like a Pharisee, you know, they're just, oh, you know, nothing ever goes wrong in my life because God walks with me every day. You bet he does. But you're going to have, that person is still going to have their, their problems. They're still going to be brought down at some point. There are two kinds of people, those who have been humbled and those who will be. There's no, there's no other category, <laughs> you know. So, and I know in the Bible we think of Job, you know, and, and who had it worse than, than him to have what he had and had, I mean, not just... One child, all of his children, you know, everything he had, everything of value in his life, it was just gone. And, and you think, how could God do that? Well, he believed Job was strong enough to handle it. And again, death is one of those things that we worry about. He doesn't. He doesn't worry about death. He's, he, you know, sometimes he just wants to grab us by the collar and say, don't you realize I beat that already for you? I've already, I've already conquered that. Don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Now, of course, it's a big deal to us. Because that we're we're afraid we're not maybe afraid of the after we're afraid of the moment of it. Nobody is looking forward to that. Wonder what that feeling is going to be like when you breathe your last, or, or you know everyone's afraid of that. Obviously, that's natural, and he understands that. But at times when we base life decisions on fear of that, he's you know he's just gets so frustrated with us sometimes and goes, look, I've already I've already beat that for you. You do not have to worry about that. And then you say, well, but but and then what brings me back to the subject of this conference is, then we get, we get bogged down, and I think Satan loves it when we do this, and I think he's the one who instills this fear in us, because he looks for any opportunity he can. And if, if, you know, if, if he sees a person and goes, you know, that person's pretty solid, I'm never going to be able to convince them to do this, or this, or this wrong, but hey, they, they got a weakness here. And sometimes it's self, it's self-doubt. And he slips in there as only he can and says, you know, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You can't do this. You might as well just come on over to my side because you're never going to be good enough to please God. And that's, and, and it works. I've been there. A lot of us are that way, you know, and we feel that at different times in our life. Some people become just almost addicted to that feeling to where you just feel you're not good enough. And a lot, right about the time where so many people in human history are doing that, that's when the Lord comes out and, and says what he said, appears to St. To Saint Faustina, tells her these things, and now through the help of, of blessed John Paul II, we all, the world knows about it, our church knows about it. And what is the message of that? I love you so much. I forgive you for anything, everything. It's not your worth that's going to get you to heaven. It's my worth. And all I want you to do is love me and trust me. And so like when I was getting back to a, a few minute, moments ago and I said, you know, um, you praise him when things are good. You praise him harder when things are not good. That's, the, that's, that's when he's at his happiness. A friend of mine in Nashville, uh, great songwriter capital there. You know, Nashville, Tennessee is known for great songwriters. And a friend of mine wrote a song a few years ago. I heard it. It was never recorded by a major artist or star or anything like that. But I heard him singing it at a writer's night. And he, it was called A Prayer of a Desperate Man. And the line was... 
Uh, what, really makes, you know, what really makes God happy is that prayer of a desperate man. That's what he understands. That's what he wants. He, he loves you the most when you're broken. He loves you the most when, uh, when you got nothing left. And you praise him anyway. And I remember when, because my family, we've lived that, uh, that idea through the time. And Haley, our little baby girl, is the one who taught us that indirectly. Or I should say God taught us that through her. It's like, man, we, we, we've lost every, you know, we'd pray for, oh, first you pray for healing. And I had people in, in different faiths, friends of mine that meant so well, would tell me things like, well, he'll heal her because he healed people in the, in the Bible. He healed people. You know, well, yeah, he didn't heal everybody physically. He didn't heal everybody. And they say, well, well, if he healed people 2,000 years ago in his 33 years of life, then he'll, 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 he'll heal your granddaughter right now. And I go, no, not necessarily. He didn't heal everybody in Judea and in Israel. He, he, he healed some. Why? To, sh to, show, to identify himself, to show everybody who he was, to show everybody that he did have power over sickness and death. He raised Lazarus from the dead, not, not to show the world, no one's ever going to die. He did it just to show people who he was. That doesn't mean we, we get to get out of, of dying, you know. And so I, I, think, I think in Haley's case, when, when she, we would pray for big things and it didn't happen, then we started praying for smaller things. Then we started saying, well, okay, Lord, how about you just, because it was so bad. She got lost ability. At two years old, she was fine. And then with, by the time she was four, she was losing stuff. It seemed like daily ability and cognizance and, and uh, motor skills. And by the time she was five or six, she, she couldn't even scratch herself if, if she had an inch. I mean, she just laid there. Couldn't eat, couldn't swallow, couldn't drink, couldn't, could never taste water ever again. Had a tube feeding. All her nourishment went through that. So you start praying for little things. You, you start saying, Lord, can you, just, can you just give her back her ability to swallow? <laughs> we'll be happy with that. No. No, never got anything. It got worse. Then you say, well, Lord, can you, we used to have a little suction machine. Those of you who have sick people in your family often that, that can't have a hard time, you know what that is, a little suction machine that you put in the mouth and you suction out stuff so they don't choke. Well, they got to where Haley needed that like every five minutes. And you Lord said, Lord, please just, just take that away. Just that one thing. Just take that one little thing away and we'll be happy. We'll be good to go. It, it got worse. Everything we ever ask for, every bit of help we ever ask for in the, in, for our baby, the answer was always a big, loud, emphatic no. Why? He didn't need a reason why. He's God. We're not. He, do, do I understand why she went through the, do I understand why anybody suffers? No. But he does. And doesn't that make life easier when you stop and think about it? When we try to contemplate these things and you go, I don't know if I can comprehend. We, we don't need to comprehend all that because he can. It all comes down to trust. When I see that beautiful image, divine mercy, the sacred heart of Jesus there and the, 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 the power coming out of his, of his heart. And says, Jesus, I trust in you. I think sometimes people think that only means I trust that he died for my sins. I trust that, I trust that he can save me. I trust that he loves me. There it is right there. Okay, that, 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 but it's, it's bigger than that. The Jesus I trust in you. So I trust in you about everything. I'm not going to worry about it because I'm going to do the best I can to do what my, whatever my role in life is. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to be the best father I can be, the best grandfather be, the best worker I can be, the best husband or wife I can be. You know, I'm going to do the best I can, but at the end of the day, it's all you. It's all about you, and no matter what happens to me, no matter what happens to my family, I trust in you. I trust that you know what you're doing. And I'll give you a quick little, little miracle he gave us, and, and I, I, because I, I, think it, it, I think these little things matter. We were very, very blessed in a, in a slightly uh, supernatural way to give us this assurance. Okay, when Haley was dying, the day she died in the hospital, she had developed for about the last year of her life, she had developed this... Uh, eczema on her forehead or where real rough skin don't know why it was just a side effect of of the disorder and there's a lot of kids with with uh, neurological disorders you know that when their eyes are closed you see these real prominent red veins you know over their eyelids that's that's a common side effect of it as well and she had also been intubated with a respirator and had this is the weirdest part had a, a huge streak of of, of adhesive 
tape where the tape had gone just like a little mustache, you know, like right along that way, and it was very thick. So when she breathed her last, that's what her face was like. Well, of course, we all start crying, and everyone is taking turns hugging each other, and we're kissing on her precious little body and just trying to, to realize she's gone. And, uh, and I get up there, and I'm kissing on her little forehead, and I realized how smooth it was. It was like a baby, like a brand new baby. And I looked up and the eczema was gone. I told my daughter, I said, Brittany, look, look at her face. And we looked and the, the vascular uh, prominent eyelids, they were gone. And here's the weirdest part. And as God is my witness, the stickum on her face was gone. Okay, now, we... There were three medical personnel, one from the coroner's office and two, two nurses in the room. They witnessed that as well. So it wasn't just family hysteria. And the, cor the person from the coroner's office said, I have never seen anything like that before. Now, okay, was that the miracle we were hoping for? No. <laughs> we, we wanted her to be healed. We wanted her to go back home with us. God said, no. That ain't going to happen. But I'll tell you what I will do. I'm going to give you this little sign here to let you know, just trust me. <laughs> It's okay. Everything's okay. She's not just okay. She is ecstatic right now. She is so happy you cannot even imagine. She feels so good you cannot even imagine. Just don't worry about it, guys. I got her. I came and did this, or I sent someone very important to come and do this. Now, five days later, when we saw her at the, uh, not to sound morbid, I'm not trying to sound morbid, but five days later when we saw her at the funeral home, and they had fixed her up and put, well, the eczema was back again. And the little vascular lines in her eyelids was back again. Which to me even more proved the fact that a little tiny miracle had happened for our behalf five days earlier in the hospital. Why did he do that? It was just something, it was no doubt it was, it was a miracle. It had to be miraculous. There was no medical explanation for it. Um, but it came back again just to show us that, look, I, this is just a sign that I was here. It was just, and how many, how few people get something like that? So we felt so blessed to get that little, we didn't base our faith on it. The faith was already there. It just gave us a great sense of uh, comfort and peace to know, you know what? We did everything we could. Don't feel bad. Don't miss, try, we're going to miss her, of course. But, but don't question anything that was done. Don't, don't blame any doctor for not doing this or just let it go because he, he was in charge of it. And that was his way of saying, it's all about me. I got her. This was my idea. You won't understand why I took her at nine years old. Someday you will. But you won't right now. And that's, and that's got to be good enough for you. So the lesson there is trust, faith, trust. And divine mercy is like when, when you talk about that, it, it's, what does he call it? An endless, infinite ocean of mercy. A never-ending ocean of mercy. I mean, in other words, he never runs out. He never runs out. That's what he is. God is mercy. God is, well, God is many things, but he certainly is nonstop, full-time mercy. And by, by what, what Divine Mercy Sunday and the, the, the prayers of the, the Divine Mercy prayers say to us is that he's not just anxious to, he's, he's practically begging us to allow him to forgive us. Now think about that. That's hard to wrap your brain around. When you realize Almighty God, the creator of all things, the creator of everyone through the millennium, through, through just, you know, the creator, Almighty God himself is, practic is on his knees on, in a way, begging us to, uh, to just ask him to forgive us. Wow. Is there any, I mean, I can't even, it's, it's hard to even comprehend a, lo a love of that level. And so I think what we have to do as members of the, of the body of Christ is, is share that and tell people about that. Because I have so many people I've known, especially in the music business. You run, you run into, a, in the music business, I've spent my whole life in it. And in America, of course, that, that usually means you see a lot of addictions to alcohol or to, to drugs or whatever or, or to sex. There's just all kinds of problems that come with, um, well, that people have in all walks of life. But it seems like the music business is very prevalent. And I see, we'll talk to people all the time. They'll know my faith or whatever. And they'll go, well, you know, God doesn't want me in that church after all the stuff I've done. It's like, you want to go, no, he, he's dying for you to come in that church. Are you kidding? He wants you in there way more than he wants me. He wants you to come in there, not to, to, to chastise you, 
He wants to forgive you. Now, does that mean we can just, like I was taught as a little kid in North Texas, and say, yeah, just, just accept him, and then you can do whatever you want the rest of your life. No, he didn't mean that. There is the word repent that comes along with that. He wants you to repent of what you're doing. And if it's a bad habit, so many of the sins we have are habits. They just become habitual. And it's hard to, have, I mean, I for one have been in the confessional so many times and confessed the same thing, <laughs> you know, over and over. And you start going, geez, I'm never getting, I'm just not getting any better. But at least I'm in there. And, I'm, and I mean it. I, I've, all, I've, never given, I've never went in and offered a confession that I didn't mean from the bottom of my heart. And you're hoping and praying that, please, please, Lord, forgive me again. I'm so sorry I keep blowing it. I keep blowing it. I keep blowing it. I'm so sorry. But that's all he expects of you is just to be accountable for it and to be sorry. And, yes, he'll forgive you every time. So I can't tell, me how many, tell you how many people I have said that to and say, look, he's, he's, he's literally begging to for, begging you to let him forgive you if, you'll, if you just will. That's the message. That's why we're all here. That's, that's what Pope John Paul II was so adamant about, is the, what he wanted to bring into the world during his pontificate, I think more than anything else, was that God loves you so much regardless of anything else. Again, I just want to say how, what a pleasure it has been for me to be here with you today. And we're, we're off to uh, Athboy tonight. We have a show on Athboy tonight. And I love being in Ireland. I hope someday to, I would love to make my home here someday. I love it so much. It's such a beautiful country and such beautiful people. God bless you all. Enjoy the conference. Thank you for allowing me to come be a part of it. So well done, Colin. Fantastic.